Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Well, no. It's just a guy who can jump really far. Hello, and welcome to part one of Superman the Complete Retrospective, a series where I trace the Man of Steel through his early days, from the first appearance that changed comic books forever, through the modern era where he remains a staple of the superhero genre. If you're new to my channel, then welcome, and if you're not, then welcome back. While my goal for this channel is to provide a variety of content, the goal specifically for these character retrospectives is to provide a quick, easy, and laid-back way to consume their early stories and track their growth throughout time. I have a lot of aspirations for all of the different characters that I want to cover, and I'm even currently doing a read-through of the early adventures of the Justice Society of America. But more on that one in another video. In fact, I had gotten the initial idea to try out this format when I was going back through Batman's early stories and realized just how much there was to catalog and discuss. And the first two installments of that retrospective are already available on my channel. But no matter what characters I want to cover in the future, I started to come to the conclusion that any video that I would make about them would end up being a half measure if I don't first talk about Superman. Or at the very least, his first year and a half. I can't really talk about the Spectre without talking about Superman first. I can't cover Dr. Fate without covering Superman first. And I can't discuss Hawkman or The Flash or Green Lantern or The Atom without first giving a cursory glance at the character who started it all. It's not an exaggeration at all to say that Superman is the bedrock on which all other superhero fiction is built. And so while I'm excited for the future videos that I'll get to make, First, we have to turn the clock all the way back to June of 1938 and read Action Comics number one. So in today's video, I'll be covering Action Comics numbers one to 17, Superman number one and two, and New York World's Fair number one. These comics were published from June of 1938 to October of 1939. All writing is credited to Jerry Siegel and all art is credited to Joe Schuster. Cover artists include Leo O'Melia, Sheldon Mayer, Fred Gardiner, and Schuster himself. First off, it's important to note that when the copyright was eventually sold to DC Comics, which was then called National Comics, Siegel and Schuster were both listed as co-creators of Superman in every subsequent publication made by National Comics. This is starkly different from the at times contentious relationship between Bob Kane and Bill Finger, because while Kane and Finger were both instrumental in the creation of Batman, Bob Kane was listed as the only creator of the character, which discredited much of Finger's early work. And I think much of this is attributed to the strong personal history between the two co-creators of Superman. See Siegel and Schuster actually met when they were teenagers. And as their love for science fiction and pulp magazines began to morph into an actual career in comic books, they never stopped creating together. While their relationship was at times strained, and the struggle to get Superman to print was an uphill battle that lasted years, it was clear that when it was time to buy the copyright, it was impossible to untangle each one's contributions from the other. These two had been creating for their entire relationship before Superman, and they would continue to do so after he hit shelves in the summer of 1938. Now that's about as detailed as I'll get, because while a lot of this stuff is important to the creation of Superman, I don't want this to turn into a documentary on Siegel and Schuster or a documentary on the history of superheroes. But one last thing that will come in handy when looking at these first 20 issues and the ones beyond are all of the inspirations that Siegel and Schuster drew from when they were refining the character of Superman. In creating the physical design, Siegel and Schuster drew from lots of references from heraldic crests to the outfits of gladiators, boxers, wrestlers, and strongmen. And the cape was specifically drawn from popular pulp heroes of the time, as well as the dashing costumes worn by Douglas Fairbanks. As far as his initial power set goes, the clearest inspiration for Superman was John Carter of Mars, from the novels by Edgar Rice Burroughs. In those novels, the comparatively decreased gravity of Mars is what gives John Carter his increased speed and strength, and that's gonna be vitally important to remember when we consider Superman's original abilities and origins. And with regard to the naming, 
Uh, Siegel and Schuster were not the first ones to coin the term Superman, which at the time was used to describe any individual of great ability, but I would say that they certainly popularized it after Clark Kent made his first appearance. Okay, that's a super brief overview. Um, here's the Wikipedia article if you want to read the whole thing and get all the details there. There's a lot of details to cover, but I'm hoping that that provides at least a good baseline glance at where this character's inspiration came from. But now that that's all out of the way, let's just go ahead and jump right into the comic books. When Superman gets introduced in Action Comics number one, we see a more stripped back version of the character than the one we're gonna see in later years, both in terms of his origins and in terms of his power set. But we already see most of the core attributes that are going to become vital parts of the character's mythos. While it's not until 15 issues in, in Superman number one, that we get the name of his homeworld as the planet Krypton, we're told in the very first panel of Action Comics 1 that Clark Kent is not of this world. He comes from a planet that is, quote, dying of old age, and his father sent him off on a rocket ship right before the planet's destruction to try and give him some better life on a different world. Luckily for humanity, the crashed rocket ship was found by the Kents, who adopted the boy and named him Clark, raising him with love and kindness and instilling in him a desire to assist humanity. The Kents pass away by the time that Superman reaches adulthood, and after their deaths, he takes up the mantle of Superman to aid humanity just as his parents taught him. And here's where we get the most foundational aspect of Superman upon which all others are going to be built. Clark could have landed anywhere on Earth, and he could have been raised by anyone, but he was raised by the Kents, and that made all the difference. The question of, you know, what if Superman was evil is one of the most frequently asked questions in all of superhero fiction, and honestly, it can be explored in a lot of cool and creative ways. What if Superman was a world-conquering warlord? What if Superman was raised in a lab and grew up to become a sociopath? What if the government found him first when he crashed and locked him away for decades to study him? What if he landed in another country? In times of more fervent American patriotism, the vibe tends to sway a bit more into the camp of, boy, we sure are lucky that Superman landed in America because of course the American ideals are the ones that everyone should be raised with. And because Americans tend to view their place in the world as such a vital and morally important one, oftentimes the positive aspects of this character are owed to the country he landed in above anything else. But I would argue, as most would, that everything good that was instilled in Clark comes solely from Ma and Pa Kent. He could have grown up anywhere, he could have been found by anyone, but he was raised by good, simple, honest people who thought that if you have the ability to help people, you should do it. And that's what makes Clark such a good guy. And man, I fell in love with this character in these first 20 issues. He's not just a good guy, he's like the goodest guy that could ever exist. We frequently get scenes of him saving people from harm. He helps miners caught in a tunnel collapse, he saves a boat during a storm, he diverts a flood, and he even catches potential victims of suicide as they fall. In one panel, he's described as a champion of the weak and helpless, and I think that this is a perfect, all-encompassing description of what a superhero should be. If you look at a contemporary like Batman, you'll see that they're so hellbent on fighting crime that they rarely have time for anything else. But Clark's got tons of time. When he visits the New York World's Fair, he even helps finish the infantile paralysis exhibit so that it can open right on time. He didn't even have to. He just heard that somebody needed help and he did it. And it honestly just gave me this stupid smile because it's so wholesome. He even tries to tackle some pretty big concepts too. How do you fix reckless driving in your city or a lack of affordable housing? or gambling. Those solutions aren't clean or easy, but Superman's gonna try and find a way. Okay, so we've established who Superman is and how he sees the world. So what can he do? So throughout these first issues, powers are going to be added here and there, but in Action Comics number one, Superman is first introduced with a core set of four powers. He has super speed, super strength, super tough skin, which makes him bulletproof and blade-proof, 
and he can leap tall buildings. And later in Superman 1, his powers are explained as a combination of two things. So first off, the gravity of Earth is much lighter than Krypton, and this is what gives him his super strength and super speed. And here you can see clear as day the inspirations from John Carter of Mars. But the Kryptonians are also described as having a far more advanced biology than humans. And this is generally the umbrella under which Superman's powers are going to be expanded. In Action Comics number three, we see that he's invulnerable to poison gas. Though in Action Comics number six, he is seen to be vulnerable to sleeping pills so this might not carry any weight. In issue number eight, we see that he has super hearing. And in issue number 11, we get the first appearance of his x-ray vision. And by issue number 15, we learn that he can hold his breath for hours. But in that whole list of abilities, you may have noticed that I left out one that is pretty important. And that's because in these first 20 issues, Superman cannot fly. All he can do is run really fast and leap really high, but we have yet to see him lift off into the air. I'm personally choosing to keep the mystery alive and I'm refusing to learn when he gains this ability, so I'm really excited to see when he first does it. In Action Comics number six, he's called the Man of Steel for the first time. And in Superman 1, he's also given the name The Man of Tomorrow. And so far, we've established in Action Comics number 16 that Clark does live in Metropolis, where he works at the Daily Star, not the Daily Planet, alongside reporter Lois Lane. And I love Lois Lane in these stories. I was honestly pretty nervous going in that Lois Lane was just going to be reduced to some damsel in distress who had no thoughts or desires of her own, but I was so pleasantly surprised and I was astounded at how much agency she's given. That's a really low bar to give something, but by 1938 standards, I was very impressed. She's crafty and witty and ambitious, and she constantly tricks Clark out of stories that she wants to go cover instead. And I love how much contempt she has for Clark in these early issues, specifically because of the persona that Clark puts on in his daily life, which is that of a weakling and a coward. And this better helps keep his identity a secret. And as a side note, this kind of serves as the explanation for why Clark is unrecognizable without his glasses. The vibe is kind of that it's not necessarily the glasses, but the fact that he changes his entire demeanor when he becomes Superman. It's still silly, but it's better than nothing. But Lois does love Superman, and they kiss for the first time in Action Comics number five, and he catches her in midair for the first time in Action Comics number six. But I did feel like by the end of these first issues that she was beginning to warm up to Clark. And I feel like this has been a really fun dynamic so far, and I'm excited to see where it goes and how long it takes to get there. Superman spends most of his time solving problems in Metropolis and shutting down criminal activities, but we do get the introduction of his first named villain, which is the Ultra Humanite. Ultra, which is what his henchmen call him, is a man with a weak body, but a superior intellect. And in his three appearances, he splits his time half and half between criminal activities and trying to kill Superman. In each of his three appearances, he tries to kill Superman with a buzzsaw, with fire, with electricity, and even trying to trap him in a pressure-sealed crystal box. But none of these things really even make a dent. At the end of this set of issues, this guy is still on the run, but I'll be interested to see if he makes any subsequent appearances or if he'll start to be phased out as we get the introduction of more and more villains. But for now, I think that that's a great place to leave it. We had a lot to cover in this first video, but I'll be excited to see how Superman grows and evolves throughout the years as Siegel and Schuster continue to solidify his character in Mythos. If you made it this far, I just wanna say thank you so much for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. But until I see you next time, have a good one.